no one's um, going to Alright then everyone, I think we're going to start. Um, so I'll just do some quick introductions, uh, explain how the, the kind of debate will work, and then we can just get right to it. Um, so on my right we have Connor Tomlinson, who is the Head of Research at the British Conservation Alliance. Uh, and on my left we have Sharara Lee, who is the former Deputy Leader of the Green Party and a founding member of Green's Climate Activist Network. Um, the debate will start with Connor uh, giving kind of an opening statement and followed by Shara. I'll then give Connor an opportunity to respond to Shara, and Shara will then have an opportunity to respond to Connor. Um, we'll then come to the floor where you guys can all ask questions, um, take a few at a time, uh, and then uh, the, they'll both have an opportunity to, to respond to answer the questions that they want to, uh, and then we'll come back to you. Um, and then that should roughly take about two hours, and then we'll have uh, about five minutes kind of closing statements from each at the end. Um, so, Connor, if you'd like to go ahead. Sure, you poor lot, you've got to listen to me in the, the first serve of this tennis match. Okay, I'll, I'll start off by being a bit pedantic, because I think we need to redefine our terms here. Because if you accept the premises of uh, my friend over on the left, then the term climate crisis is a very easy way to package top-down solutions because it's an emergency, as we saw with COVID. However, when you say climate, what do you specifically mean? We need to break that down into subsets because you can't solve everything at once. And nowhere in the IPCC report does it say the oft-touted claim that Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez came up of where the world is going to end in 10 years. I think it's probably about eight now, so it's ticking off the doomsday clock quite a bit, but excuse my scepticism that we will, won't be underwater. Now, that is not to deny that we face serious conservation challenges. What is it, about 20% of infant mortality is caused by indoor air pollution. Um, a University of Phoenix lecturer has done some studies that there is so much soil aridness now that Without genetic engineering, a loaf of bread baked in the 1790s is so nutritious we can't grow that ourselves and bake it. So that's what we've done agriculturally to our dirt. So as you can imagine, our guts aren't too happy with us. So this is a bottom-up problem. However, doesn't mean it's not solvable. We have a lot of solutions. We're here to debate the delivery of those solutions. Now over the last 100 years, again, this is why I'm skeptical about the apocalypse narrative. Last 100 years, Natural disasters have gone up, but deaths from natural disasters have gone down by about 90%. Brilliantly encouraging. That's through things like the Dutch exporting their flood technology to Bangladesh to lower the amount of flood deaths. Fantastic. A lot of the natural disasters now are caused by mainly terrible climate policy. Does everyone remember in 2020 when we had the wildfires in Australia and California, fairly close to each other? Very dry season, okay? Perfectly fine to accept that those were weather conditions, the aridness was worsened by potential climate change. Totally fine. Why was it set alight? Because there were no dieback burning. Because specifically in California, they'd imported Australian trees. They're full of eucalyptus oil. They all go up like a bonfire if you drop a match anywhere near that. And why was that? That was the federal government planning top-down, heavy environmental controls without doing any damage assessment just because it looked good on paper to have more trees. So when we do this totalizing thing of saying climate, we need to break it down very specifically, otherwise the people on the ground that are dealing with this thing are going to get hurt. So, the way to deal with that then is whether, and I don't wish to mischaracterize Shara's argument here, but judging by the Green Party standpoint, I think they are going to argue for a more socialist approach. Whereas, I'm not going to argue for a capitalist approach, mainly because that's a word made up by Marx to automatically slander anyone who likes a free market. However, People are just going to say, okay, well, socialism, top-down control, we can consolidate things. It's capitalism that's plunging the planet into um, any kind of ecological crisis. Well, if you look at the Kuznetsko, every nation in the world that grows richer gets a form of environmental consciousness, mainly because you can't be affording to be concerned about environmental wellness if you're broke poor. We had the MP for Malawi. One of the guys there at COP26, one of our fringe events. And he was basically pleading with us, saying, look, you guys in the West, you've shut us out. Please give us some solutions as to how we can stop our people burning all of our forests down as indoor charcoal. Because they've got to eat. Our, our people don't care about forestry when their kids are starving to death. So can you export us some energy? Can you uh, uh, make it affordable to us to switch to even fossil fuels at this point? Anything? So 
this is why, again, we've got to be very careful about this decarbonisation narrative, because it's, it's a great idea for us to move to renewables when they start working. At the moment, they don't. We'll get into that later. But we've also got to be careful we don't price out the third world in our narrative. So we've got to be very careful about considering for that sort of stuff. So it is not capitalism that's plundering the planet. Socialism does not have a very good track record on environmentalism. You look at the USSR. After the Greenpeace brought in that massive whaling bill that saved all the whales, etc., between 1970 and 1991, USSR were responsible for the majority of whale deaths because they had a tragedy of the commons approach. There was no privatised property. Nobody had a stake in it, so you just plunder it. And if anyone believes that expropriating property will make the world a better place, look at your local park benches. They're hardly in the best of state, are they? Because nobody has a stake in caring about them. And even if you aren't willing to say that that will be the case, you do have to deal with people that are private landowners because 90% of the forestry that will be grown in this country is on private land. You've got to find some way to incentivize them. If you think that walking up to them with a barrel of a gun and just saying, plant trees in your damn land is going to do a thing, not going to work. And that was, actually came from the mouth of a Tory MP, by the way, that I was trying to sit down and tell him his tree policy was terrible. So this is not a party issue. This is an ideological issue. So what do we go towards? A lot of people may say, okay, socialism hasn't worked so far. We can implement it another way. Well, go back to the foundational texts of Marx and Engels, because that's the way that most people are arguing for socialism. Uh, inherent in that is the sort of class division ideology and violent revolutionaryism. That's why it's failed everywhere. There is something inherently rotten within the ideology. You may think you're being compassionate, and you may think that you are the exact kind of person that could bring in the utopia, but you cannot. There was no track record for dismantling the dictatorship of the proletariat. They wanted a revolution so bloody it made the French look like child's play, etc., etc. Power and wealth was the goal. So if you think that we're going to make a better planet through doing all that, even if you think, okay, it's fine, we can confiscate some wealth in the meantime and we'll come out with a better product, the exact kind of tactics you do to make the world a better place are what you're going to use when you have that utopia to cling bitterly onto it. So how about we do it in an ethical and effective way to get there? And so... The way we can do that are market solutions. Allow me to give you an example. Right? I wrote a paper for the Adam Smith Institute recently. Quite fortunately, some of the government ministers listened. I know, right? The government actually listening to something sensible. Shocking. But Quasi Quartering decided to take, and Greg Hands as well, he wrote me a letter back, take my assessment into, into consideration about the nuclear funding. Because before the government just used the guaranteed loans. And then the nuclear people, because it took 10 years to build, and there's so many regulations that went up massively over budget, and we were all on the hook for it. And I don't know how many of you guys are actually working, but, I mean, if you're happy for the government to spend your money, wait till you see the amount of tax that comes off your first paycheck and then see if you're still socialist. Um, I told them, okay, you might want to turn around the funding bill so not everyone's on the hook for that. Use a feed-in tariff, and we can drip feed it into the energy prices over time, and then after the thing's built, well, then the consumers will get energy independence for basically a lifetime and cheaper bills, and they seem to have adopted it, and that's fantastic. And the way to market this sort of thing to climate skeptics as well, because we've got to engage with the other side of the argument here, is you can say, okay, national security question. Because most people in the climate skeptic argument are just as hawkish on me as China, right? A lot of people are very concerned about China's human rights abuses. Do you know 80% of our battery manufacturing comes from China? So if we want to build renewables, we are giving them a lot of money just to store all that energy we've got. Oh, and even if we did that, it would take from 2021 to 2029, um, sorry, 2022 to 2029 now, get mixed up in my years, cost about $3 trillion, and we'd only be able to sort uh, store about 27% of consumer capacity, so we'd have massive blackouts. So we'd make China really rich, make us dirt poor, and no energy. Bad idea. Nuclear energy independence. Isn't that the perfect national security argument? And it's cheaper. So you can use market solutions that work, that don't involve stealing from people, and you can market it to climate skeptics in another way. I don't think we're going to get better than that. Thanks, Matthew and Libertas, for this uh, invitation. And, and Connor, that was a, a beautifully insightful, comprehensive introduction. And, you know, hats off to you, because starting is not always the easiest thing to do. And I've been given the opportunity to even offer a rebuttal. So, you know, that, that takes some uh, nerve, doesn't it, for you, for you to go first under those circumstances. But, you know, to be honest, I'd like to start by saying, actually, firstly, just to point out that I'm not officially representing or seeking to defend Green Party policy today. Um, I'm, if anything, I'm coming uh, as a co-founder of the Greens Climate Activist Network, and there's a bit of politics behind all this, of course, which you can look into if you, in your own time. Um, but I do very much uh, particularly enjoy coming to the University of Sussex, given your heritage as a bastion of free speech. No cancel culture going on here. 
absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and as somebody who, who comes from a professional philosophical background as well. But I did want to just start by saying that um, one of the main things I think that people come together around is just the capacity to debate and engage intellectually and emotionally with ideas. That is going to be our route out of, however you want to frame it, which we'll come to in a second, the climate crisis of sorts. And call a thing by its proper name. It is a crisis of thoughts. And first observation is that I don't think that directs us or compels us to say how the solution is going to come out. I mean, I think you made a linkage there between a top-down and a bottom-up approach. And certainly, um, environmentalists, uh, we in Greens can as well, do advocate fully a grassroots approach where everybody is equal. We don't rely upon um, a hierarchy of politics. Certainly not. We wouldn't rely upon uh, our politicians or leaders, as has magnificently been shown with COP26, to get us out of the current rut. It is a problem of our own making, and it's a problem that we're going to have to get our heads around. So what is that collective uh, problem? What is the solution to it? Well, again, I would say different strokes for different folks. You know, We don't need to get bogged down in ideology, whether you want to appeal to Marx or others, um, left or right wing, whereas, you know, although capitalism does, is often um, construed as a right wing proposition, we'll come to that in a second, I, I would say that the thing that we most need to understand is what is our common humanity and our motivation, sorry, I'm getting a, a call from, uh, not, not from Green Party Central Office, don't worry. Um, there is a <laughs> the, thing, the thing I think that is going to help us to overcome the crisis in front of us is not left, right, political ideology. It's a common humanity. And it's a means to that end. And understanding what are the values which are most precious and dear to us. That may sound a little bit esoteric. It might sound idealistic. But ultimately, it's those values and ideals that motivate and move us which is going to help get us out of this rut that we're in. So when we see uh, political leaders and others converging um, on climate summits, we're almost expecting the worst. We're not really hoping anymore that they're going to bring us a credible solution. And why is that? Because we're not advocating at any of these summits meaningful system change. Now, unfortunately, so could go for the juggler at this point, the solutions which are being advocated um, by Connor do not require system change. Capitalism, that system and that structure, embedded in our society though it is. And I'm not going to say that everything about that system is faulty. In some respects, it's incredibly efficient way of managing and negotiating our desires. Of course it is. I can go into a store and buy myself a luxury tie. And I could decide to forgo that as an ethical consumer and direct that where it's more needed. Let's say the 24,000 people dying of malnutrition and preventable disease. I could do more with that parcel of capital in some faraway land. And that's my choice as, as an ethical consumer, shall we say. But that doesn't really help overcome the problem of global capitalist culture and consumption. If that's our problem, if our problem is one in which we're exporting our carbon production to faraway lands and then salving our consciences by saying, well, actually, we've reduced nationally our carbon consumption, but let's just ignore the fact that we're importing crapula from China, and it's sending up on a scrap heap probably in India. Okay? So if we join the dots and we recognize that our whole way of being and acting and interacting is at fault, unless we actually tackle the root cause, which is 
reinforced by the capitalist system, have your cake and eat it, carry on business like there's no tomorrow, then we're not going to tackle this problem. So we can argue about how long we've got left to go. Um, eight years, 10 years. I don't think it matters to put a date on it. I've been in hostile environments or audiences where it's been used as an argument against me. You guys predicted we wouldn't be here any longer. Uh, we're still here. Therefore, that's an argument against your predictions. I'm not in the prediction business. I just need to be able to say, call it 10 years, 100 years, call, even call it 1,000 years. Let's say we've got 1,000 years. In the scale of human civilization and history, that is very close to last chance saloon. That's all I need for my argument. I simply need to point out we could be, if not the last, the last but one generation to actually fix this calamity that's before us. Are we going to do that through capitalism? I don't necessarily see the advantages in arguing about that system, because what I do know, given all its efficiencies and the fact that we are habituated into it, it will require us to transform and transition from it. So I don't need to argue about um, whether or not it's the best system. I know that it's a system that we've currently got with us. So what we would normally do in politics is to say, we need to get from A to B. In the process of doing that, we have to reckon with the fact that you need to roof over your heads, you've got a mortgage to sustain, you've got all the trials and tribulations of the capitalist system upon your head. We're going to make sure what? It's a collective action problem. We're going to make sure that in getting from A to B, we don't unduly disadvantage people at the lower end of, of the scale already. We, let's make sure that we engineer or implement a system which requires everybody to pull their weight as equals. So what is that system? And there is a system. There are several. But the one that I would be advocating for is a carbon currency. Okay? And there are some um, already in use, the EU emissions trading scheme. right? That's not a great scheme, um, but it's an idea. It's an idea which has been implemented, which allows people to cap and trade on the basis of a currency which is pegged to carbon. That doesn't go far enough. That's not radical enough. But it helps us think outside the box. It helps us to understand that when we take from plunder from the planet, as John Locke would once say, you need to leave as much and as good for the next generation. We haven't been doing that. Whether it's parcels of land or raw materials, we have not been leaving as much and as good for the next generation. And moreover, we haven't been acting in a way which properly measures or calibrates our debt to the planet. Now, the planet isn't, well, for some, James Lovelock, the planet is a living thing, Mother Earth, Gaia, which we need to accord greater respect to. But even if you don't think, even if you think that the Earth is an inanimate object, we could at least get into a situation where we respect the planet rather more than we do by thinking it's not OK just to dump stuff on the environment for future generations or for its own sake. So this question is all about value. So our economic system, um, the world which we currently inherit politically, uh, democratically, or what passes for it, that's the system that we've got. In order to be realistic about our chances, we need to transform it, for sure. We need to moderate our behavior. And we need, there may be a, uh, uh, a, there may be a place for incentives, as Connor's put it, right? But I don't think we're talking about the level of you need an incentive to look after that park bench, to use your example. We're not talking about that kind of incentive. We're talking about a motivation which is rather bigger than that. We're talking about how can you get people collectively, and it's a collective action problem, to do the right thing at the speed, the urgency, and the magnitude that's required to ensure the survival of the human race? Is that a proposition that motivates you? If not, why doesn't it? So I would rather say, because we don't have to go for a univocal position on human motivation. You can say that some people are motivated by self-interest. I think that's incentivization category. Others are motivated by doing things for its own sake. You can have a debate about um, whether it's uh, legitimate for somebody to abuse a cat, yes, and what the penalty should be for doing that. 
but um, that will also depend upon whether or not you think um, a non-human sentient creature is deserving of respect in its own right. So there's no getting away any probably political or behavioral question you care to think about will be based upon your own uh, moral conviction uh, on what's important to you and what is valuable for its own sake. So I would say, because I've probably got only a couple of minutes if I've overrun already, I would say that the things that are most important when you think deeply or otherwise in your moments of um, meditation, the things that are important, invaluable, and I say invaluable, right? you can't put a price on them, are a, a beautiful sunset, breathable air, Okay, we take that for granted. We don't actually pay somebody or a company, well, we might get that way, yeah, to actually breathe that air. Drinkable water, that's a luxury for many in the world. So when you look at these genuine things that are being commodified or assets that we take from the natural environment and don't put back and don't leave as much and as good for the next generation, we are living, obviously, in an unsustainable fashion. I don't think that the current system, capitalistic that it generally is, will help us to get what we need to get in the time available. So ultimately, we need to be realistic. We need to do uh, what's politically necessary. Yeah. Um, well, we need to change what's regarded as, as politically possible to do what's scientifically necessary. And the science is telling us we're running out of time. So you can have um, a self-interested motivation to do that, if you like, or you can have an altruistic motivation to do that, if you like. But ultimately, I think we need to start valuing ourselves more. We need to understand that some people are going to be motivated by fear because they don't like the proposition of losing everything. Others are going to be motivated by different things. We don't need to settle that. I think we should just accept, objectively, that people are going to be motivated by different things. The fact that there is a climate emergency and a catastrophe coming around the corner, for some, that's demotivating. I think for others, it's just a necessary fact. It's not alarmist to say that. It's, an alarm, it, it's a fact which happens to be alarming. Personally, I think um, the more we get our head, heads around collectively that proposition and the finality of human extinction, the better. And then we will act accordingly. Totally fine, yeah. There's plenty to cover there. Uh, firstly, idea of a bigger motivation. Same ties into the, what you said about shared values, common humanity. The optimism of something like a COP26 climate summit where we, we can create solutions that we can all abide by. No. Uh, people temperamentally, and this is why you're the party you're affiliated with is going to lose a lot of people. People temperamentally are not always attached to grand scale abstractions. The idea of the sun monster is going to come and devour us, as some people will hear what you've said as, they don't care. Maslow's hierarchy of needs means a lot of people are, as with plenty of countries around the world, too broke in the immediate to care about a grand scale crisis. And people are going to choose the food on their plate before any grand scale abstractions or ethical consumerism, etc. I'm not saying that's right, I'm saying that's a reality you have to deal with. That's why I said you need to particularize the issue. It's very unhelpful to sit there and say climate crisis. It is. It turns people's brains off immediately. When you say, this particular species of fish that you've seen in an aquarium, like sea life today, I trot it down just because I was down here in Brighton for the first time in ages, love the place, very sentimental. This particular species of fish is going to die out from our behavior. For example, jellyfish. Look cool, look lovely, particularly in the display where they have all the LED lights, right? Because of COVID, there are more masks in the ocean than jellyfish. That should disturb everyone. That's an immediate impact that we have had. That Great Pacific Garbage Patch, about 10% of that now is comprised of masks worldwide. And we've done that in two years. Okay? So you can market that to someone as a very particular issue to clean up. Then that particular person can go about, they can research the issue, they can implement a solution, and we have a bottom-up way of doing things. Now you said that you don't need political hierarchy for this, and then you immediately said system change. Who is going to involuntarily change the system? And the party you were affiliated with, and I know you said you weren't defending Green Party policy, but they're affiliated with Extinction Rebellion. They advocate system change. They advocate it top down. They do. Roger Hallam, who invented it, was kicked out, does. And the idea of a climate assembly is a very vanguardist idea. It is essentially the idea of a dictatorship of the proletariat. It's 
Grouping people around that have the same ideology, they may have diversity of background, skin color, etc., which Exile's charter says, but that doesn't mean they don't all have groupthink. And they sit in a room and they decide what policies you should live under. They are unelected and they are going to tell you how to live to best fit the climate emergency. That sounds a lot like SAGE to me and they got everything wrong during lockdown. Okay, then capitalism. Because you fell into a bit of trap there. Because you came on with your notes. Brilliant, glad you prepared, so did I. But I said in my thing, not capitalism, misnomer. And we also don't live under capitalism. We under live under a form of corporatism. We cannot claim the Conservative Party are either conservative nor capitalist when they're giving massive state subsidies to every energy industry under the sun. It is not subsidized if we are forced to pay for it. Same for drinking water, etc. They're not commodities which you can just take out of the ground wholesale. Nobody owes you anything. And um, even if you say, oh, free water, someone's paying for it somewhere. If you, and also, if you think you're going to tax the rich for all this stuff, guess what else the rich can afford? Private jet tickets are just going to fly out of your tax zone. So... Uh, the carbon trading thing, though, there's a market solution. Great idea. It was, uh, was it Article 6 or Article 16 in the Paris Accords? They recently ratified a COP26. I know a couple of the countries dissented, like Brazil, but we have a global carbon market now, um, to some extent, and that allows us to trade carbon. Now, that shouldn't be tied to restrictions. I know MasterCard are developing a credit card that caps an individual spending monthly to their carbon footprint. So don't get smart meter people, because that's how they're going to track it, and they're going to use it to restrict you. But. Um, the idea we can use carbon trading and offset it, I've spoken to a group called the Dutch Green Business Council, and they, rather than buying renewables like Amazon do, so again, buying from China, all the solar panels and that, rather than that, they donate to local conservation projects across Africa, across Europe, etc., and they offset your carbon through doing that and create job opportunities. Great idea. That's only possible for a carbon credit market. But that's a market mechanism. That's not... Uh, relentless consumption, which I'm against, I'm not, not materialist in that way, that is a market free exchange mechanism. And so we're not doing capitalism here, we're doing free exchange, which is the right of every person. However, if we were to do a top-down regime change, system change, which abolishes the incentive of property, etc., as some have called for, as lots of people in XR have called for, covertly and implicitly and overtly, that is not going to work. And the question will always be, and I want you to keep this in mind, who is doing the confiscating and what if you don't want to give up your stuff? This is getting better and better. This is just great. I love this. Um, so let, let me just, I, I, I'll try and be a bit, bit more um, coherent with, with the points now. Let's take three points. Um, sounds like you're advocate, sounds like your criticism of uh, my caricature of the current status quo is that it's not genuine capitalism, which is fine. Okay. Um, I could argue back that it's symptomatic of the, 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 the capitalistic system that it results in some people profiteering in some ways and resulting in a less than equitable solution and it seems to be that your counter argument is well actually if it was pure capitalism everybody would get what they want in in a more sustainable fashion right um, I would say that the system that we've got is just inherently unsustainable because it does rely upon um, a certain amount of haves and have nots and so that's just not going to work um, in terms of then your your follow-on point about authoritarianism. Authoritarianism is a problem for the left as the right. So how do people construe themselves? I'd rather judge them by their actions, not their words. So you're absolutely right about that. Now, um, it can be as much of a problem for those who are claiming to be, again, socialist. I don't know whether they are. I'm not really interested in what they call themselves. I'm interested in how they go about their business. And I think the means is much more important in the end that people claim to seek. So when you think about you know, some of the things you've been alluding to, uh, maybe they're straw men, fine, but let's say that there are possibilities. It's possibilities that people can get themselves into such a state. Uh, I might say insulate Britain fall into this camp. Or uh, those people who are trying to prevent um, relatively low-paid workers from getting to work in Canning Town a couple of years ago. Yeah? Or, or those people burning pink. Right? We're not supposed to use their name, but you know, we, know what we know what we're talking about here. It's just an easier way of referencing people. Right? Not, oh, don't give them publicity. Look, let's just be mature about this. So burning pink going around and vandalizing party political offices. Okay? So that's you know, totally counterproductive, and, and um, it's not a good way to win friends and influence people. These are author authoritarian means of going about politics, and I don't think they shift opinion in the right way or in the right direction and in a sustainable fashion. So I'd agree with you on that. That's authoritarian politics. It can come from any motivation. You know, incompetency is just as negatively consequential as malice, as far as I'm concerned. So it's... There's nothing in, intrinsic about a grassroots-led movement either that is authoritarian. And these citizens' assembly, second point, 
um, and where you see them work well, and you know, tend to be in countries maybe where the population is such that people engage a bit more anyway, if you think about Iceland. These citizens' assemblies are just that, where you have a diversity of ideas. You do not have people, it might uh, originally be such that it's self-selecting and you get groupthink. Groupthink is a major problem, okay? I, I would attest to that. Groupthink in society, in life, is something that we, we need to overcome. And I would say, far from um, citizens' assemblies actually uh, amplifying groupthink, they are an opportunity to uh, overcome groupthink because you will be spreading that um, uh, invitation uh, literally to everybody. You will be having to uh, argue with people who are climate skeptics, for example, as I've, some of you will have seen that I've, I, I, <laughs> I encourage those encounters because I think that that's the way in which you can um, win over the people that you need to win over. And the, the, um, the alternative is actually um, incredibly unpalatable to me. Okay? So, I mean, what is, people sometimes talk about eco-fascism. Well, what do they mean by that? Well, the, the two words are conjoined in such a way that it should be reasonably obvious. Eco-fascism then might be a proposition which is people through authoritarian means doing what they think is required to um, live in a sustainable manner. That is not a um, legitimate way of going about politics. What is the possibility then that through a lack of um, authoritarian solution, we will actually get to where we need to get? Well, we're going to have to bite the bullet there. We may not get to where we need to get because we believe in democracy. We believe that people need to be persuaded, uh, maybe through representative democracy, to get what they want. But it's not that we need to um, erase the political infrastructure that we already have. We may not, as I've been trying to uh, argue, we may not be able to rely upon our politicians unless we had those who were converging on Westminster during the climate strikes. The school children, unless we were able to manage a way in which they literally just swap places overnight with the politicians, right? Um, they might be a bit more grown up at this stage. Well, yes, that's my point. I think they are well motivated. They had uh, a good reckoning of the climate science and had those um, school children be put in the House of, of Commons where Theresa May and others were, we would have got um, a, a stronger chance of getting action where we needed it. So we're not going to be able to erase those political institutions, but nor must we rely upon them. Ultimately, politics is beyond the ballot box, but politics is beyond the electoral system. It's in addition to representative democracy. It's what's happening all around. It's the fact that people might find themselves um, unable to speak their mind on a topic in a university. That's why these spaces are incredibly precious, because that's where it starts. That's where we have those ideas germinate and flourish. But so People's Assembly, I think, aren't um, uh, intrinsically authoritarian. I think they're the solution to groupthink. Uh, capitalism, I don't think whether you call it an imperfect one or your perfect ideal of it, I think is um, a hindrance and is going to uh, prevent us from getting where we need to get because it's not costing things or calculating things according to the cost of the earth. And carbon trading, which I'll probably come to more in the um, discussion, is something that I haven't um, fully fleshed out, but it would be one in which each and every one of you would be given a budget for the year and you're not going to trade on it, actually. That's it. You might not be able to afford a flight uh, once, uh, more than once a year. So we're, we're hearing um, you know, disdain for that proposition. But you will find, it's a collective action problem, you will find that people can be got or persuaded to do things which might initially f seem self-sacrificial if everybody else is. And I think you've seen time and time again, I don't want to call that socialism, right? I just want to call that a collective action solution where people can do the right thing if they understand that everybody else is pulling their weight. But they won't even recycle if they see the futility of it because their next door neighbour doesn't care. Thank you. Um, so we'll come to the floor for questions now. So if you guys just want to raise your hands, it'd be good to uh, either just gen ask questions generally or if you've got a specific question for a specific person, um, that'd be great. So got Please give us something to fight about. <laughs> Yeah, the point you made 
about in conversation about the values that, that matter to us as a society, I think something that we resonate as a good being. Um, to me, it seems there's, there's a lack of sort of buy in in society and, and there's a decline in community at the minute. So, I suppose my question would be is it possible to see action on, on such issues when people don't feel a sense of belonging to a wider community? Despite the fact that 75% of the UK electorate believes that climate change is an issue we should be concerned about, mm. when polled by YouGov, 39% of um, people who knew about Extinction Rebellion found that it was, uh, they disapproved of it, and only 19% approved of the group and its, uh, and its action. Do you believe that in becoming a political and uh, uh, social change movement, Extinction Rebellion has hindered the environmental movement in any way? Sure, I'll tackle those one by one. Um, global solutions. Firstly, I think it's, okay, there's the argument that a lot of people in my sphere bandy about, including, uh, I do a Monday night show on talk radio, load of fun, but the guy who hosts my show is a grumpy old granddad who goes, well, China's doing, outpacing us on pollution, so why should we do anything? We're 1%. Okay, if you, and this is a self-interest question here, obviously the world leaders like money, so if we develop a solution here, we can export it around if it's profitable, if it works, etc. That's been the massive race in developing renewables. That's why the development of small modular reactors, that's why the recent development of nuclear fusion, um, that's why if we can make a method of plant construction that works and is cheap and doesn't take a decade and go over budget, genius, because every other country in the world will adopt that because they want energy independence. Like, look at France, for example. They did massive nuclear capability since the 70s. They're now selling energy to us. Same with Sweden. I spoke to Sweden's junior environment minister, and she said since the 70s, the reason that Sweden can even do renewables alongside it is because they've got a series of uh, nuclear plants that's still been up for the last 50 years. They've got seriously strong grid inertia. They don't have fluctuations. They've got a baseline. I suppose the people at Whitley Wind Farm, who are the biggest advocates for inshore wind, um, also, I was a bit tepid on them. They actually look quite nice now, I've seen it. So I, again, I advise everyone go see it firsthand. Even they said, look, we need nuclear or gas because we need something, right? So if we develop a solution here, let's take the nuclear reactors, for example, that can become a global thing because we don't have to agree ideologically, religiously, politically, philosoph philosophically, if the money's on the paper. And I disagree that free exchange, not capitalism, is inherently exploitative and extractive because if you have a sustainable market, People want to stay around and expand the consumer base to continue making money. In the short term, yes, some people will get caught out by doing things like um, polluting the water supply so other businesses can't compete. However, sustainability is in business interest because if you want to keep your consumer base alive, you have them around forever. So, in terms of an international solution, how can we do the funding on this? Um, I did another paper on this with the Clean Capitalist Leadership Council where they said if we do cross-border tax reciprocity, which means that if you do the interest on a loan given for a sustainable infrastructure project, if you exempt that from uh, income tax, that means business will loan that out, they'll front the capital for it, they'll happily make a profit on it when the loan's turned around, and then countries around the world that are run by dictators, you can circumvent the dictator, mainly who are taking money from the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative and depleting their countries, you can circumvent the political situation, you can build the infrastructure on the ground, the people get it, and the businesses make a target profit. You're exploiting self-interest of both there. So that's something that can work, and we don't have to run into political barriers. Um, okay, I'll try and keep this up too, too, too short. Uh, people being too atomized. Yes, been a major problem, particularly under lockdown, major problem with social media. You're talking to a wider cultural phenomenon here. There was a book by Robert Putnam called Bowling Alone. And he looked at it and he said, um, as multiculturalism, as uh, all these different factors of different uh, religions, ideas, cultures come together, the only things that increase are TV watching and protest marches. So we are facing a bit of an issue here where we don't have a unifying ethic. As you say, collective action. I'd love a bottom-up spiritual revolution that meant we all agreed on the same trajectory, but you ain't going to get it. And all of your arguments, particularly confining people to their carbon credit, that's an, a top-down solution. So don't call it authoritarian if you want. If you're going to tell me what to pay for and what not to pay for, I'm going to call it authoritarian because I'll be the one living under it. Um, in terms of people that are too atomized, how can we do that? Yeah, this is comes back to my earlier argument of you've got to tailor-make your solutions to people's temperament. That's the same thing with the left. The left are very concerned about dispossession and economic output. The right are very concerned about freedom. So the right 
if you want to get people on the right on the side, one, mark it as a national security issue, because they're always going to go, oh, China, China, Russia, I don't want to be at war with Russia, get off Russian gas, or bring them to somewhere like Whitley Wind Farm, bring them to somewhere like Sea Life, bring them to somewhere like uh, Wingham Zoo. As soon as they establish a connection with something, a, a personal relationship with it, they have a stake in caring for it, and they're going to go out and do the volunteer work, because it's going to be a life-changing experience. Final one, uh, people hate Extinction Rebellion. Yes, because they're not particularly honest about their aims, but if you track it down, they are. Um, Roger Hallam, for example, guy set up. Made Stop Killing Londoners in 2017. Uh, studied a dissertation where he cons com uh, compared himself to MLK and Gandhi. So, egoist as well as an eco-terrorist. Um, also, if you're going to inconvenience people, this comes back to the people being too atomized. If you're going to inconvenience people on the road and influence their daily lives, again, people don't care about abstract collective things. They care about whether their kids can get to school and whether they can make a meal. Now, the only way that we can do that is free exchange. Uh, Infant mortality has plummeted. You've had uh, most people subsisting on a dollar a day about 100 years ago, and then um, free exchange with things even like the mobile phone. The mobile phone's been given to Indonesian fishermen. I'll wrap up in a second because um, I'm conscious. Uh, it's been given to Indonesian fishermen, and so they can look at fish markets and uh, trawling sites with their friends. And so the abundance of fish has gone up massively, because if you can coordinate with people you couldn't speak to before, everyone gets fed. So only through free enterprise can we overcome these kinds of issues, and XR are not for that. And so people implicitly, with the uh, obstructions to their daily lives and the callous indifference to people's individual suffering, because they're so concerned about a collective goal, that is not the way to market yourselves, and it is unethical and ineffective to do so. So much to talk about. Um, Sorry about that. Firstly, this feels like a dress rehearsal for something. You need to do this again sometime. Yeah. Um, in terms of, um, I'm not really sure uh, where you can find this quote of Marx. Um, I did find it once and I had trouble relocating it. Um, I think really what we need to understand here, because it feels to me that you are thinking very creatively within your system. I don't think you're actually flexing that system at all. And I, I want us, for me, this is the take home point of this discussion, right? I want us to be able to think creatively outside that system. So let me try and um, just pin down what I mean by that. Um, you don't want, you, you can't eat an abstraction, right? I, I get that. I don't think my talk about impending climate catastrophe, which is just the most literal way of me I have in the English language to be able to describe what's about to happen if we just carry on business as usual, I don't see that as abstract. It's not abstract for us to see what forest fires look like or northern Germany, just last summer it was, um, being assailed by um, extreme weather events. And they're having their whole lives turned upside down. You may remember pictures of, of the Rhineland and northern Germany, uh, people looking outside their window. They, were actually had, they had nowhere of escaping because the whole street was full of rubble. That's not an abstract thing, that's happening now. I would say what, what's a bit more abstract in terms of a hypothetical thought experiment is our current predicament as a human race, as a civilization, uh, whether locally or globally. Do things have to get that much better, or, sorry, that much worse before they get better? Or are things just gonna get so bad that we run out of time to improve things at that point? They just get so bad before they just go rock bottom and that's it, we're gone, right? Do we? not care enough about ourselves. It's an existential question as well. It's a question about um, what value we put upon ourselves, not just as individuals, but as a representative of the human race and all the civilization that came before us, right? If, um, if you, you know, th there was a great scene in, in the film The Age of Stupid, Pete Postlewaite. Right at the end, somebody's projecting a laser beam into um, outer space. And that's, that's our last act as a human race before we just go extinct. And it's supposed to impress upon us. I think he says something uh, worse to the effect of, did we really not think that we were worth saving? And there's something quite um, impressive about sending a, um, a beam, uh, a data beam into outer space, which is containing all the information digitally about human civilization, and there's nobody there to, to read it, okay? Nobody's going to be on the receiving end of that beam. It's just a way of impressing upon us exactly um, how big this problem is that we're facing. And I think that we're, I think the issue for us is predominantly psychological. And all the solutions that we have outside the system 
they're, they're quite simple. And I'm not talking about a retreat into a past bygone age which people think they'd overcome and they've improved their lot. I'm talking about a way of living, because we you know we have alienation in this society. Some people actually found a part of themselves during the pandemic which they hadn't before. You know, they actually found a certain peace or a work-life balance. Some people found community. Some people got to learn the hard way what were the important things in life. So if we want to, I'm kind of a glass half full kind of guy, as you can tell, I'm not saying that, you know, that the pandemic was overall a good thing. I wouldn't will um, a deadly virus upon anybody. But the point is that there may be some lessons we can learn from it just in terms of, you know, carbon production and consumption activity went down by double digit, you know, CO2 on an annual basis. And we were still able to survive that. And I think the, the, the crunch point for us is to establish. So, you know, I mean, it's good, it's good that you, and I don't, um, you know, I think, um, you know, in a way, because I'm, I'm not easily, you know, insulted or deterred, but I think, you know, in, in that reaction, that's, that's actually very important, that reaction. Why, why do we scoff, okay, at the idea that um, we need to go in some sense backwards in order to move forwards? Because I don't doubt or deny that we are going to have to extricate ourselves from a world in which we're buying designer clothes. We're going to have to extricate ourselves from a world in which we think it's okay and cool or, st or high status to have a large house which is beyond, our, beyond the means of future generations to sustain it. But we can. We can actually quite easily get to that state. It's one in which people are better educated and better the value the things that are important to them. And overnight, you could see people poo-pooing a fancy car on the street. What are you doing? I don't respect you for that. Very quickly, you could see overnight, oh, wow, you're recycling that. Or you're actually bartering, because I agree also with free exchange, OK? It's a creative thing. But if we understand what's behind that, and we've seen in transition towns, in, in the Brixton pound note, the Bristol pound note, um, you know, they may not have really got off because one of the problems was that they were indexed to uh, the Bank of England again. But if we genuinely created a currency, so where I'm driving at with all this is that you can't eat a series of zeros in your bank account when you're staring onto the street in, in, in Westphalia and you can't move. You can't access that bank account, OK? It's not going to get you anywhere. The, the basic material needs you, that you'll be deprived of, you will no longer be able to relinquish using a series of zeros in your bank account. So we need to get away from that system where um, exploitation is inherent, collecting and consuming goods is inherent, to one where we value relationships for sure, where we value the things in life which deep down, you know, when we go on holiday even, we realize are important to us, a beautiful sunset and the breathable air and the drinkable water. Once we recognize that, um, I think we've got a way out of this. Once we recognize we don't want to find ourselves in the absurd situation of sending um, the sum of human existence in the digital beam into outer space with nobody to receive it, once we understand that existential condition, we, we will be able to find the motivation to overcome it. But we are at last chance saloon. That might sound an alarmist proposition. I just think it's accurate. We could well be the last generation able to do something about it. I was in an, um, a meeting some 20 years ago now, um, sorry, well, 18 years ago, with Ken Livingstone in, in the, um, as, when he was mayor of London in, in the um, London's living room. He was asked that question about climate change. And so 18 years ago, he was able to say it's too late. It's already too late. That was his understanding and reckoning of the climate science. I suspect it was also a product of him understanding how difficult it would be to course correct, if you like, the juggernaut, which is human habitual action. Because that's actually our main problem here. It's not the failure to understand what's in store for us if we don't change our ways. It's actually getting ourselves to change our ways. Yeah, no, no. Speaking to the microphone. Uh, the scoff wasn't my cynicism at no. you. The scoff was because of the lockdown thing. Yes. Um, what you may have overlooked, when you said we cut carbon consumption and survived it, the United Nations has estimated that each year uh, of lockdown has cost the third world 20 million extra starvation deaths. So some people didn't survive it. 
And I spoke to one of the former founders of Extinction Rebellion, and she openly advocated the reappropriation of lockdowns to reduce carbon emissions. So the regression will cost people's lives. So it is not cost free. And who is doing the limitations on how hard your house is, how much carbon you can spend, etc. That would that would be my only concern, but I'm conscious of people asking questions. Well, no, I mean, just I mean, just absolutely the impacts of a pandemic were felt differently in, in different areas. And in this country, I would say that, um, you know, we had a different set of constraints and uh, <laughs> some people would have to rely upon uh, a return to pre-pandemic just to be able to sustain themselves because they were working in the commercial industry. Others would have seen as a consumer that they were buying less and they were consuming less. And I'm just saying at that level, they were able to survive. They were able to find other things to pre preoccupy themselves and they may have turned to, to um, more meaningful activity. But that's, that's simply the point. It's about work-life balance. Mm. For, for people to um, start valuing things like the sunset or free hmm. air, yeah. um, and how if we came together um, and recognised sort of the importance of our individual contributions, like recycling, um, how that could be, uh, yeah, a way out of this. Um, do you believe that what should what the solution is is a restoration of a sense of community, which isn't in itself remedy? caused by capitalism, but caused by uh, urbanization, um, people living in cities, and work-life balance. Uh, and as you mentioned, the pandemic has sort of highlighted how work-life work balance in general has, has detached from their local areas. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, fed, for mm. And I think these little rewards are sort of what can change a person's personal mindset. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, essentially you only think of yourself and your personal situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Uh, Should I go first? Yeah. yeah. So, um, firstly, I don't think I actually gave you the Marx quote, which I said I wasn't able to relocate, have I? Um, the more you find, which I think is really at the heart of this 
let's call it a paradigm shift that we require here, yeah? So instead of talking about current, the actual hard currency that I have at the minute or zeros in your bank balance, I want to talk about the value behind that. Instead of fetishizing um, a logo uh, on a designer outfit, which has been manufactured in a sweatshop, and then retails for 10 times more than without the logo, because that's status driven, yes? Let's think about the actual product and the material worth of it and the utility of it, okay? Once we start doing that and organizing society, and I come to Marx in a minute, we will actually have the exit out of what is a lot of our problem, which is status driven, right? Fake status driven, right? Status anxiety, as uh, Alan de Botton used to call it. Marx, the more you find value in external things, the less you find value in yourself. I think that's at the heart of the problem here, right? And that's, that's an existential proposition. It's a bit like um, some years ago now, um, a public attitude survey. Again, the more you earn, the more you think you can't afford what you really need. Well, it can't be that you, 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 you don't have more stuff because you can afford more. It's just that you end up generating ever more insatiable desire. They're insatiable, you can't actually satisfy them. And they're more difficult to acquire, okay? It's the same way that when you go up this so-called social ladder or um, earning ladder, you might have to lose some friends, shed some friends on the way because you can't really f feel um, the difference otherwise. Okay? So what we've got, that, this is an existential problem. If we start value things properly, if we understand that our lot is connected to future generations who aren't around yet, if we just imagine what it might be like to be somebody who, not even our contemporaries, right? You could have children, grandchildren. You could care enough about them to be worrying about this already, and that might give you all the motivation you need. But you could actually start worrying and thinking about people 50, 100 years in the future, right? I think it would be very difficult for um, our ancestors 100 years ago to imagine the kind of luxuries that we're currently living with, right? We have a tremendous capacity to engineer our environments. This is your question now in terms of, is part of the problem, if you like, that we're not sufficiently attuned to our environment, that we don't really respect it enough, and we feel almost that we, we're not required to attend to the consequences of our actions. I think that's what it comes down to. So yes, I do, I do believe you know, we are insulating ourselves to that extent, that we're living um, at risk of neurosis, you know, we don't, you could argue that it's a sick, sick society in some senses, and many of us are, are, are living in a way um, which is uh, very enjoyable, okay, it does rely upon uh, the assets that other people have produced for us, yes, if I, if I walk into uh, the National Gallery and I see, you know, I'm assailed by these incredible masterpieces, okay, in previous generations, I would have had no access to that. And yet this is a public asset and it's free. I don't even have to donate five pounds, it's voluntary. Okay. So my point is this, and, and that's the kind of digitized data which is gonna be shot into outer space with nobody to see it. So I might find that both looking backward, looking at our ancestors and what they have given us as a reason to um, regret my not doing enough. And then I think about future generations who aren't around yet, okay. Um, th and their incapacity to actually shake us by the collars and what the hell are you doing? You've got this information, we're at last chance saloon, you're the last generation, or if you're lucky, the penultimate generation. Don't just leave it to the next one, though. And you knew this, and now you've saddled us with an inhospitable, uninhabitable planet. Um, personally, that's enough to motivate me, plus the knowledge that everybody else is going to do whatever it takes. You remember contraction and convergence theory, you know, that was when I was at school, right? We don't talk about it anymore. Everybody else at this um, world summit is going to legislate and we're going to do whatever it takes across the world, yes? We've all got this parcel of carbon budget and we're going to stick to it. For, personally, that would be enough for me to do it. Knowing what I know and that everybody else is doing what's required, and I can sacrifice um, those silk ties and those designer outfits, right? I can sacrifice all that uh, if I've got a roof over my head and I've got sustainable locally produced food and I'm even growing it uh, on my own allotment or using my own garden, right? 
because that in itself is incredibly rewarding, right? I've got an olive, we've got an olive tree outside our house at the moment, which is actually growing olives, right? Okay, uh, so, you know, extraordinary uh, beauty, um, you know, turn our urban landscapes into a bit more of an environmental haven, I think that could help. Um, so what's our way of getting out of this situation? We can't, and we don't need to, when I say system change, junk everything we've got, okay? At the moment, it's just tinkering around the edges. It's not even in transition mode. The EU ETS is not, doesn't have what it takes, but it is a sign of our understanding that we need to start pegging our activities to carbon. And I think we just need to bite the bullet, okay? So have a, have a piece of plastic or whatever it is, or just have it as an app on your phone, where you have got your carbon budget. Every activity of yours, every piece, I'm, I'm sure that is at last I've managed to generate a scoff from you. I hope so. You have, you have managed to generate Every piece... And I'm just going to ask you, if you don't like that proposition, what's the alternative? The alternative is Pete Postlewaite's digital beam. Because that's, that's what we're facing here, right? It's up to you. We've got the knowledge. We've got the information, right? You can either adjust your um, behavior to fit what's environmentally possible to live within, or you can carry on business as usual, and you, we will face extinction. And we don't need to quibble about whether it's 10 years, 50 years, or 100 years. It's coming soon. It's coming soon. Let's grasp our predicament, and let's make the necessary change to survive. And I, you know, get on a war footing, as it's sometimes been said. Right? We need to get on, on a war footing. If we're all doing it, we can do it. And, and finally, finally, it's not authoritarian, because you'll notice the one thing that I haven't advocated is that we must do everything um, physically necessary, uh, including subduing people. That's not what I would ad be advocating. That's why I've been criticizing Burning Pink and even uh, Insulate Britain. My proposition is, is harder than that. It's that we do not want to risk becoming um, inhumane in pursuing that humane goal. That simply does mean we, it's, it's harder. We have to do it through democratic means. If we can't do it through citizens' assembly and persuasion and in, in a combination of grassroots and top-down, because we can just carry on doing what we want. Freedom is a wonderful thing. I agree with that. Right? But the freedom to carry on living like there's no tomorrow, I don't regard that as freedom. I regard that as exploitation and um, a debt to future generations which they cannot afford. And I regard that as morally irresponsible. Okay, I'm going to answer all three questions. Um, I just need to ask you a question because I, in all due respect, I don't think you fought your philosophy through to its endpoint. Who sets the carbon limit? Who sets it? Who sets the carbon limit? If everyone carries around a piece of plastic with an app on their phone that restricts what they're able to buy, can you tell me who sets the carbon limit? Well, I can tell you it will be equal. I can tell you it will be based on what we can afford. Okay, so equal. Okay. So if anyone goes over that limit, what happens to them? You know what the answer is. No, I don't. No, no, no. No, it's a good question. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, what would happen um, most likely is they wouldn't be physically prohibited from doing that. So what we're relying upon is a system it's of it's it's a new system of social meanings if you like where there would be a downward pressure that, it's the same reason why my preferred um, solution would be one in which you aren't able to sell any um, spare carbon credit it should be sufficient incentive or motivation for you to spend less than your budget and to say great I'm actually doing even more for future generations than the next person. I'm not going to go out of my way to spend my spare credit. Um, so, so yes, you, you wouldn't... I don't think we would, we would have a penalty as such. I think what you would um, require is people to do it, guess what, from the goodness of their heart, because they know it's the right thing to do. So That's their motivation. That's why it's a, a fundamental shift in how we're expecting people to behave, because they realise the merit of doing it for its own sake. So it's cultural and voluntary, just... It's not entirely voluntary because, okay. as you say, and this is why we're relying upon legislation. That's why we're not junking everything <laughs> about the system that we've currently got. If we, I hate the system look, we've currently look, got. Look, taxes, are you saying that taxes are, are involuntary? 
Yes, they or are. voluntary. What they are, are they? Are. They're involuntary. They're involuntary. They are yeah. by definition involuntary. Exactly, but do you sign up to that as being a citizen no. of the state? No, I, there's I no, didn't. There's I, no possible scenario in which you... I didn't sign a damn thing. Of I course you didn't. I was born here. Well, well that, that's big, right? That's pretty it's big, true. right? I didn't you're sign expecting, a damn you're thing. expecting, no, no, wait a minute. You're expecting to be born into society and at a point at which you can comprehend, you're going to yes. be presented with a series of contracts. Do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want this? And you're going to say no to a few. And they say, well, okay, well, where are you going to go and live? This is, that's my, not how, this is my point. You no, have, that's why we need no rational. That's why we need option. rational yeah. consent. Yes. Hypothetical rational consent. Yeah. What you would do if you were rationally predisposed, living in that society, would you consent to a situation where some of your freedoms would be no. in your better moments constrained because you know no. that's for the greater good. No. That's how it works. No. That's how legislation so, so works. I'm going to, so I'm going to pick up on that. One, who determines the greater good? Because I don't trust. We do. To, no, we don't. We don't do that. We don't do that. We don't do that. Because, for example. I, I elected someone who thought he was going to be a libertarian government, and guess what? He locked me in my home for two years. So you can just go back on your promises if you're elected in office and there isn't a damn thing we can do about it. Clearly. Got, we've had photos. This is, this is the hilarious thing where he said, do what's required. You think the people that are going to set the rules are going to, going to do what's required? Didn't work in the Soviet Union where they abolished property. But that's cynicism for you. That's true. I'm, I'm, it's I'm, entirely I'm true. Hang on, hang, on hang, on yeah. hang on a minute. Hang yeah, on no, a minute. Hang on a minute. Right, so do what's required. The Soviet Union, their internal party members, they had the most lavish of cars, they had prostitutes, etc. So they clearly weren't abiding by the communist principles. And then lockdown, nobody seems to have abided by the rules that they set. And I hate them just as much as you do, I'm very sure. Um, so, if we're going to keep it voluntary, as I'm going to respond to question three, which was your question with the IPA can. Um, voluntary carbon labelling, basically like calories on food that can make people do healthier health choices. Yeah, I've actually written a policy on that. I think go, uh, companies should be adopting that personally because then people can make more environmentally conscious choices and if they see that's good for business, more businesses are going to adopt it and hey, bottom-up revolution. We haven't got to enforce it top-down via legislation. And I didn't sign up to it, any legislation. And all legislation, including taxes, is enforced at the barrel of a gun. If I don't pay my taxes because I don't like the NHS, for example, I'd rather go for private health care, which I can't afford. Don't get me wrong. Can't afford that because the NHS hikes the prices, but there you go. Um, if I decide that I don't want to pay for the NHS because I don't use it, someone comes and knocking, knocking on my door. If I don't hand them over the money there and then, guess where I go? Prison. I go for prison for tax avoidance. That's force. So I've got no say in that. I didn't sign up to that legislation. Um, question two, I'm going to do it in reverse order. Uh, yes, the nature of the values of conservation. Um, there's a Scruton quote where he said, the British countryside only exists because of about a thousand years of the preservation of property rights, and we have something quite unique there. Um, so, I think what we would agree on is ends rather than means. And I think where you're conflating what I'm saying is I'm saying complete free exchange. I am not, and this is where I'll go on to question one in a minute, I am not saying legislation about restricting the market, I'm not saying the government should privilege certain things, and I'm definitely not saying consumerism. I'm not saying making a deity out of the fast cars and fast fashion that you can have. That's a bottom-up spiritual revolution. And that means people, for example, valuing the carbon when they're buying something so we can give them more, informa more information through carbon labeling. Great idea. The first one, that comes back to the dichotomy. You said, I, you said you are not for the system. Neither am I, because the system is rubbish. It's a system of international bodies, uh, like the UN, the World Trade uh, Organization, the World Health Organization, World Economic Forum, of different uh, states, Canada, UK, USA, etc., and different companies, Amazon, Microsoft, who are a bunch of hypocrites, but they're telling us how to live, and they're not willing to live under their own stuff. And it's interesting to use the word corporation. Corporation came from Benito Mussolini. It came from corpus. It came from the melding of the public and private into a body. That was the prerequisite to fascism. So it was the government and the corporations having the same ethic, melding together, and saying not only how you had to buy, but what ethic you had to have to buy from them. And currently, they are implementing ESG scores. They are environmental social governance. That is the score of the ethical practices by which a company goes about. They, they're doing this thing called stakeholder capitalism. So rather than shareholders making a profit, it's now stakeholders. So you have to be a company that acts in the interests of people who are interested in the environment, people who are interested in uh, social issues, etc. Fine to take those into consideration, but who is your advisor? Who is telling you how to operate as a company rather than just making money and keeping your customer base, advise, uh, customer base alive and not killing them? And so we are going dangerously close to an ethical state and if we start controlling how much carbon people can buy from the top down, or there's something punitive to do with that, I see no distinction between that and a form of fascism.
discussion about the idea that we can happen at uh, or say try to like change the behavior and to say like adjust the behavior of people or expect people to behave in some way mm. by forcing people to behave like uh, for example in terms of climate change by forcing people to behave more mean then you're going to have the opposite effect and that's actually what is happening in a lot of countries in Cuba for example in Sweden and a lot of countries where they try to put um, you know, that make women and, and, and men more equal, actually that inequalities have like been, become bigger. So actually the look has an opposite effect. Also something that, that I think is a bit related to what Luke says, like I don't think the only problem also is, um, it's not only that trying to sort of control the population to actually take greener decisions, when actually the government in countries where they have to take care more of the environment, for example, what happened in the Amazon, right? When the Amazon uh, born, and a lot of like, um, in the case like in Bolivia, which is, which is my home country, 20% of the Amazon is in Bolivia. But the government didn't allow international help because they had cocaine plants there. So if we just say that it's just individual decision that actually is the government that is causing a lot of problems to climate change, what would do with that? So, and then um, my other question would go what you say about taking more like organic decisions mm. and cleaner. Of course, and like about luxury and all the things that you mentioned, but to be able to take that more cleaner decisions, you need to have more wealth. Because people that are relatively poor or middle class, they're not capable of buying organic meat. Mm -hmm. So it would be better to actually be able to improve climate change, to actually improve economic growth and improve the quality of life and actually being able to allow people to have their own business. So actually they can take more cleaner decisions. And as like, like Connor mentioned about like how poor poor you're not going to care if there is organic meat or is meat. Mm -hmm. You're just going to care if it's meat. So maybe we'd go from there first, so that is like my question for, for both. Yeah, like a lot of questions. What would um, you guys say to the argument that <coughs> in order to uh, avert this kind of crisis, that we need a really quick solution in order to get back, the only way of doing that is to go fast? And I'm not saying that's my opinion. Devil's advocate, yeah. What would you say to that argument that we need a really quick solution and that's the only way to get back? So it kind of goes back to my last question, I think it's still relevant. Do you think you're both being a bit too idealistic with your solutions in terms of what you want to actually happen? Because if you want to change people's sort of motivations and opinions, and you want to do it absolutely so that society moves in one direction, when has that ever actually happened, like ever, with mm. any issue? Because even today, we still have people who think the earth is flat, people who are racist and homophobic, despite the fact the majority of society are otherwise, yeah. it still exists. So actually making society move in the same direction as yeah. a whole, is always impossible. And the problem with the free market, I would say, is that even if you do it for your country, getting the whole world to collaborate yeah, together, sure. especially when you have such a place in the to do Russia, China, and the rest of the world, I don't see a situation where they bond together over the climate just for the sake of saving the planet, maybe. Even if it was benefit for their country, I yeah. don't see yeah. a world where the Ukrainians come up with a great solution for nuclear power yeah. and then give it to the Russians freely. And then I'd see that would be a bit of like an ideal, like they would just collaborate for the sake of it then. But don't you think there's more to it than like just ideally collaborating and do you think that'd be possible? Yeah, I mean, I think we're roughly in the same space here, the same place here, because that's, we've got enough of a headache trying to work out a palatable solution which I, I would describe as not forced, and I'll come to that in a second, when we've properly apprehended the scale of the problem in front of us. So, and the trouble is, is that the longer we leave it, the narrower that window opportunity becomes. And that's why, you know, some are saying, well, it's already too late, and we need to start thinking about transformative adaptation, for example, as the route out of this. And on the one hand, so what are the scenarios? One scenario is Ken Livingston was right 18 years ago. It's already too late. If it was already too late 18 years ago, it's damn well already too late now because we're not just going to, we're not getting a grip of our situation here. Um, in addition to the collective action problem, if you can call it that, about everybody being aligned to do the same thing voluntarily in, in, the, in the space of time that we've got available, we've got another difficulty of probably a fairly strong instinct that we might have, if not to survive ourselves, 
as individuals for as long as possible to look after our nearest and dearest first. Now, um, Rupert Reid actually has got a very good argument um, to try and overcome those uh, inhibitions, and he's, taking, he's kind of turning a virtue into a necessity here, um, which is to say that we all have, on the face of it, these very strong uh, impulses and instinct towards our children, for example. Even when we don't necessarily have children, we might have relatives or children of relatives whom we care deeply about. And he's using that as an argument to remind us of exactly what we are leaving behind for our contemporaries. This doesn't rely upon thinking about people who aren't around yet, for, for whom our connection might be a bit distant. But once we start thinking about our children or potential children, or relatives, or children of our relatives, and we, we, we understand the, um, the lack of initiative simply because of their, their years that they are able to take and that we need to start taking on, their, on our behalf, that should give us all the motivation we need. The trouble then is, is that um, if we're not doing it in the space of time that's available, and it's already a worse predicament than it was 18 years ago, then are we going to get reach where we need to get in the time that's available. So this just does, does come down to, um, again, I mean, earlier I would describe myself as a kind of a glass half full kind of person. Uh, well, I am. You know, I just do think that we, once we understand our predicament, then um, the solution will follow. Will it, will it follow with sufficient numbers of us? Well, um, probably, you know, I don't want that possibly to become probably not but I do see at the moment that that's what's happening. And I can see it, 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 it doesn't help to be told, oh, well, your lot were predicting um, catastrophe uh, 10, 20 years ago and it hasn't happened yet. I'm, I haven't been making those predictions. All I'm relying upon is that if we carry on business as usual uh, and we can't predict it with certainty, we don't need to, but what we can predict with, with the certainty that's required is that we need to change course and we need to do it quickly. And the, the trouble is with our human instincts and our psycho psychology and our, the way that we're, we're socially organised at the moment is, is that we will just end up retreating in a, into a, a dystopia um, where we're looking after number one and our nearest and dearest and we're scrabbling around trying to do that and we will be longing, and I do mean longing for a day in the past when we had done more, knowing what we now know. And, and finally, this carbon uh, budget system is not authoritarian. Because my point is, and I, I don't think you've defeated my objection around hypothetical rational consent, which is what you would rationally consent to if everybody else was doing the same, because you realise that is the best way of organising society. You will bind yourself it's not, you, they can't be all, you know, I mean, I mean, perhaps you think that you shouldn't be paying taxes, I don't know. But the thing is, is that most of us will find a, a set, if not, you know, more than a subset of laws, which we actually think are worth having, okay? So everybody drives on a certain side of the road because overall it's better for safety if everybody just follows that rule. So this carbon budget is something, according to me, that we're going to have to sign up to democratically. That's the means by which we will implement it. And then, yes, it will be backed up potentially by penalty and force. It's up to us. We'll decide exactly what the penalties will be. But the model is such that if we're going to approve it democratically and we've signed up to it intellectually and emotionally, we will want to do it. We'll want to do it for the right reasons. So we're completely short-circuiting and bypassing this idea that you are going to be motivated by some other incentive. You're not. You're going to be doing this for its own sake because you realise it's worth doing for its own sake and that's going to be motivating us. I believe there's a Benjamin Franklin quote, or it might be misattributed to him, but it is a nice one. Um, Democracy is two wolves and a sheep voting what's for dinner. So you say we decide it's punitive. No, the lawmakers decide what to enforce on. And again, if you give people a lot of power and control over people's lives, they won't necessarily follow, follow the rules themselves. And I don't trust anybody to make particular rules over me. As far as the tax question, I'll address everyone's questions individually. I'm very comp compartmentalized. The tax question, uh, VAT in Texas and Florida, there is no income tax. 
They have one of the better states' budgets, particularly because the Democrats keep going cap in hand to the federal government because they're overspending on terrible social plans that don't do anyone any good. Um, it's like school outcomes. They've got per capita school spending in uh, Republican states that are much lower, and the education outcomes are better across the board for minority and mon non-minority students, even though higher minority populations are Democrats, higher spending per head. So uh, taxes does not equal good. Uh, they also do equal force. Um, what else is there? Okay, so question four. Let's go backwards. Uh, so the problem of collective action. Right. Okay, yes, yes. International cooperation. That was it. Um, a few misnomers in what you said. I never said that they were going to share it freely out of the goodness of their heart. I said, to your original question, that if we develop solutions we can export throughout the world that are very profitable and replicable, it will be the natural solution. And I said in my opening remarks that the easiest way to convince someone who's a climate skeptic is to frame the argument in something like energy security because you won't have to rely on Russia or China. That's a perfectly selfish argument, and they'll rush to do that. That's why, for example, President Trump, boogeyman to plenty of people in here, I'm sure. You might think he's a bit of a knobhead, but did you know? He repatriated oil manufacturing in America. Now, if you combine that with carbon capture, of course, that hasn't been developed very well. That's something I'm sure we'll agree on really needs to come leaps and bounds. And we could export that everywhere. That would be fantastic because that would, uh, as plenty of countries that need to burn fossil fuels before they can use renewables, um, that could lower their carbon footprint and they could get richer and more profitable. But President Trump, he repatriated oil production to America. America became energy independent for the first time since President Nixon set the target. And between 2017 and 2019, America led the world in emissions reductions. That's right. The man who pulled out of the Paris Accords, who said climate change might well be a hoax, his climate policies were practical enough to circumvent his own ideological predispositions. So, forgive my crudeness, do shit that works, and it doesn't matter what differences we have, people will adopt it for their own self-interest, and we will reap the benefits from it. Uh, I'm not skipping question three, I'll come to it last, because that is the most robust one, because uh, I've been doing some research on that as well. Um, the short answer is no, uh, but I'll, I'll get onto it. Questions one and two um, from Luciana. Uh, forcing behavior. Jean Piaget has a thing on this. I've stolen this from Jordan Peterson. Um, of where it's the equilibrated state hypothesis of where entropy will set in the more force you apply to coercing someone to do their behavior. Because if they don't adopt a behavior habitually, they don't do it of their own free volition, and then over time, they are going to try and circumvent your authority, they're going to try and get away with as much as they can, and the whole society just collapses. So you keep trying to force people to do things, you're, this is why tyrannies collapse over the long term, that's why the USSR ran out of money, for example. You are going to run into so many enforcement costs that you bankrupt yourself morally and economically. So trying to force people to do certain behavior changes that aren't bottom up, or rather top down, be that through carbon limits, etc., isn't going to work because people are going to abandon it and they're going to reject it and they're just going to break the law and they're going to do it to you out of spite because you have told them not to. Um, as for the government intervention thing, yes, there's, there's a strange example here actually. The uh, almost backing up thing of the cartels, they were slash and burn agriculture for the cocaine plants. Um, under lockdown in, in Mexico, barely anywhere shut and it's because the cartels run so much of it that they said, okay, anyone who isn't vulnerable can keep working and Mexico didn't have a very high death toll. So, the strange thing about that is, if you have a financial incentive vested in it, and the cartels are obviously evil, don't get me wrong, but if you have a financial in incentive vested in something, you will keep doing it, and you'll keep doing it in a way which keeps the thing alive. So if you have a financial incentive in keeping your customer base alive, you won't just plunder the planet for your expediency because you want your business to be around for future generations you can impart onto your own sons and daughters. So... Strangely enough, the government being in control of it, for example, the people setting net zero targets that are going to be either out of office or dead by the come to fruition, do you really think they have much of a vested interest in doing it in a way that is sensible? Because I'm sure we agree, most of the policies coming out of the Tory party at the moment are terrible. Um, it's because they don't have much of a vested interest in it, and it's because also their paychecks are not tied to whether or not our GDP per capita, I don't care about GDP overall because it's just, that's nothing. GDP per capita plummet. Like, if politicians started getting paid by the amount of their ability to balance the budget and actually do things that works, I'm sure you'd see a lot better solutions because they'd be worried about the performance evaluation. Uh, as for the eco-fascism argument, again, no. Because um, that's just the other side of the coin to eco-Marxism um, with added racism, which isn't wonderful. Um, how do I put this? Again, falls the the enforcement cost idea, uh, completely unsustainable. And also, don't do anything in utilitarian fashion that will corrupt your soul as you're trying to build a utopia. Because you can't stack bodies like a Tower of Babel on the way to heaven, because it will just fall apart. And so it doesn't matter under what auspices you do that, 
it doesn't matter how how many crimes you can excuse getting to the utopia we want to not only build a world that is worth living in and impart it onto future generations but we want to do that in a way which sustains an ethic that they can preserve that world and make it enjoyable to living in so no fascism marxism socialism etc is never the answer because they're all equally murderous um, i think we'll do one more round of questions and i'll ask you to both kind of keep your responses to five minutes and then we'll um have a five minute closing remark three because that's a challenge <laughs> <laughs> so does anybody have any more so i guess mine's more of a like a rebuttal to what you said about the international labor thing is it not being still idealistic to suggest that we would just give it to people based on the merit that they would be then easily like relying on other countries? Because wouldn't it be more economically sensible to just make a surplus in your own country and sell it to other countries rather than giving them the means to actually make their own energy? Do you think there might be a potential for the interest of national security to run counterproductive to the uh, like financial incentives to your country? Um, it recently came out that I think um, a third of Britain's like uh, fuel potentials are privately owned, and of like um, like over a thousand over a thousand of those are described as inadequate to part. So I was just wondering because protein kind of often it's a very people centered role. Yeah. I'll go reverse order. Um, will climate be overshadowed? No, because a lot of these conflicts are actually driven by resource scarcity and by climate. I mean, the only reason that Germany isn't being more hawkish is because they were dumb enough to scrap all of their nuclear power plants, have rolling blackouts across uh, various regions, which actually cost lives and a fair few million, and then go and invest more money into the Nord Stream 2 pipeline than they spent on NATO. So they're buying more oil from their NATO enemy than they are paying to defend themselves from it. And then China, we're, in, we're jockeying for global power because China's building the Belt and Road Initiative. And we're being kind of stupid. So I agree with the carbon credit idea. The problem comes with international carbon taxes. If you start tariffing things without any revenue neutrality, then a lot of countries like Malawi, the guy I spoke to, he won't buy from us to upgrade their infrastructure. Instead, they'll run to buy Chinese money from the Belt and Road Initiative. And what that means is they're going to move in Chinese workers into the region, so there's going to be no regional career opportunities. They're going to build it with crap steel. The infrastructure is going to fall apart. They can default on the loans. And then, as we saw with Zimbabwe, they seized their only airport, so China basically now controls the country. So... It's jockeying for international influence, and it's all based on energy security and resources. So climate policy is actually at the heart of most of these conflict scenarios. And it's only going to increase if the disaster scenarios do come true. It's going to be less disastrous for the first world. For the third world, I've written, co-written co and edited um, papers on local African climate problems with some of the budding best and brightest over in Africa. And a lot of that is to do with flooding in coastal areas like Nigeria and that. And they're going to be seeing a lot of people moving around house scarcity. If we see those kind of pressures, there's going to be fights. Especially in Nigeria, for example, where it's split between north and south. There are religious conflicts already. When it comes to space and resources, anyone know the Rat Utopia experiment by any chance? The smaller the space got, the more fighting broke out. Very dangerous. So yeah, no, it won't be overshadowed. It is at the heart of it. If we address that, then we might be able to de-escalate somewhat. You're still not going to get over the ideological conflicts, but partially. Um... Privately owned stuff means companies are needed. Yes, that's why we li liaise with companies. We actually put on a fringe event at COP26 that involved industry heads as well as politicians. And we just let them talk. And funnily enough, um, we had a guy from ExxonMobil there, which was, I raised my eyebrows at, and they are doing a stupid amount of investing in renewables because, again, they know that the time is up on fossil fuels, generally. People might want to move away, and this ties into your question. It's because people don't want to develop and just sell overseas if we're going to be honest, quite a lot of countries are very xenophobic. And it's just a national borders thing. It's just a national identity thing. Now, whether you think that's right or not, that's the way world we live in. So, of course, they're going to want energy independence. Like, sure, they might sell it overseas, but then if you're in a buyer's market, why would you want to be dependent on someone? France just cut off the pipeline to Jersey when we were having a bit of a spat with them over the English Channel. 
So of course we want energy independence even from our allies. Um, so yeah, the privately owned companies thing, we got them in there to, to talk about that. Um, and most of the companies are adopting some sort of thing because they want to keep their consumer base alive. They don't want to poison them with fossil fuels. Like uh, Fossil fuels, this is the crazy thing, right? Sorry to go on tangent, but fossil fuels were necessary. They were like an opioid for collective civilization. They, they massively dropped infant mortality. But we've become addicted to them. So yeah, we need to come off them over time. But it's not that the fossil fuel companies were always evil. They were peddling something that we needed at a time. Yeah, we need to get off of it. But for 200 years, when people were inhaling uh, wood burn inside their own house and there were no forests we needed it so yeah companies are going to come to the table and they're already making diverse investments um i've already answered one of those ones and then international security versus finances i think i've answered that already okay i think i've covered pretty much all of those i hope so that, that's sufficient i mean i agree with with much that you said in that that round actually and it was so perspicaciously put um i mean just to add a few more examples really um, I mean, these aren't provocations to you, although I, I'm curious to know what you would think, because, I mean, at the heart of our debate, I think, is what is the minimally rational thing for us to be doing, given our predicament? Now, there's a lot of common ground between us in terms of a reckoning of the problem, the scale of the problem. Um, like, you know, you, you want us to be able to get off fossil fuels, okay? So that's, that's one of the number one problems. What do we say to, within the current system which allows it, what do we say to, um, you know, real estate merchants in Florida who are selling estate on, on the shoreline, knowing that year on year it's um, encroaching upon on the houses, okay? And, and the people who are buying these properties uh, on the shoreline are just willfully ignoring that fact, okay? That's not rational, okay? It's not minimally rational thing to be doing. Yet, I would say the system encourages it. The system encourages people to carry on behaving that way because they can and nobody's going to stop them from doing it. If we are able to exit this circle of it's it is a it is a it's manufacturing value which doesn't have value, okay? The the value of that property um, submerged in the ocean is lost, is lost to the ocean. How are we going to develop a new system of value? Is, that's my problem, right? And I'm saying we need to link it to the consequences of our action in a way which recognise the despoilation of the planet so that we can continue to live habitably. If we really, I think that, I think that the, the main difference that I do detect between us is the scale of the urgency. Because I feel as though you're talking in a way which allows us to carry on business as usual, tinkering around the edges, improving the model that we've got, moving away from, I mean, you've even, we haven't even got to nuclear energy. I don't see nuclear energy as any kind of a solution because I'm thinking ahead, even if you felt, I mean, even James Lovelock, who was an absolute brilliant scientist, you know, he was advocating for nuclear with a heavy heart because he felt it was the only way that we could buy time in order to get ourselves off fossil fuels and, and to do so in an habitable way. And even with the, the carbon currency model or quota system that I was advocating for, I'm not proposing that we turn to that overnight. We've got to have a transition. So I might want to borrow some of your ideas you know, on, uh, with, on carbon currency and even incentivization and getting people to be ethical consumers um, whilst phasing in my more, you know, hard-headed uh, carbon quota system, right? So we do have a transition here, but ultimately the problem we face is um, are we going to get to the place we need to in the time that's available? And I don't see we're going to do that um, in the way that you're advocating. I do think that we can do that if 
I mean, another fundamental source of disagreement, it seems to me, is how much license, let's use the word license, right? Because there's different types of freedom, clearly, you know, it's not just wishful thinking type of freedom where I want to be able to do that, right? I mean, that's, that's quite, quite a childish notion, isn't it? I want to be able to have my cake and eat it. No, we're not, I don't think we're advocating for that. So I think that there's no escape from a more rationally conditioned freedom. And I think I, that's another source of disagreement between us, which we need to get to the bottom of. So when we had a bit of a clash around um, willfully allowing the force, uh, sorry, willfully allowing um, the state to enforce laws which you choose to um, transgress, I would, there is a sense in which you can be free in allowing the state to punish you, yes. Because you're knowingly, you're knowingly breaking the law and you've chosen to do that and you're taking um, the risk of being caught. But the reason why you've consented to that is because you choose to live in a, in a society in which there are laws and in which there are consequences to breaking them because the alternative is unpalatable. The alternative is chaos. The alternative is um, a stateless um, regime. So we need to identify um, rational constraints on our own behavior, which were prepared almost like in a social contract. We, we are prepared to relinquish for the benefit of, yeah, a social good, a social collective good. OK, I'm going to try and reverse engineer that. Um, no. Uh, there is no social contract because you're making an appeal to a general or collective will in a Rousseau fashion that doesn't exist. It's not general, it's whoever is dictating the will with the levers of power at the time who can send the guards to your door because you haven't followed a law. And they set the laws. You cannot, and it's also oxymoronic that you willfully allow the state to commit violence against you because violence is not consensual. Um, also, the laws themselves may not be legitimate. I did not want to recognise any of the lockdown laws. I'm not saying I broke them in your your honour, because obviously I can be punitively punished for that unless I live in Downing Street. But um, you cannot... I think it's m immoral to obey an immoral law, because then you're just going down the I was just following orders line. Um, I'm not accusing you of doing that, by the way. Uh, business as usual. I want the abolition of income tax. I don't think you can accuse me of supporting the system that's founded on that, especially when that was meant to be a temporary measure in about the 1800s and has stuck around ever since. It's definitely the status quo. Um, real estate on the shoreline, the people buying that, by the way, are the people most pushing climate change. I mean, uh, not climate change, uh, uh, climate change measures that are authoritarian, rather, because the Obamas just bought a multi-million dollar mansion in, uh, where was it, the, the valley? Um, that's going to be underwater if predictions go the way of Al Gore's. Uh, same with... Bill Gates, I mean, he actually imports sand by the shipping container to his own private beach every year. Meanwhile, he says we should all be drinking recycled feces water. I mean, please, Bill, practice what you preach. Um, but then it comes down to a fundamental philosophical disagreement, and this is what I think underlies a lot. A lot of people don't talk enough about morals when they talk about policy. They talk about what can we do rather than what should we do. And you say rational in that we have to rationalize constraint. Okay. Um, I am not comfortable forcing anyone to do anything. I can make the argument to them, but I'm not going to force them and compel them behavior. Not least of all because the enforcement cost means it's not sustainable, word we love to use, but also because I am not, I am not going to be egocentric enough and abandon humility and tell them I have all the answers because there are going to be unintended consequences to that. So the rational versus free sounds like the follow the science argument that was used under lockdown. That was all what we were beaten with. And unfortunately, that led to massive restrictions which messed, for example, 50,000 ca cancer diagnoses a year, 20 million starvation deaths, um, a mental health epidemic, and according to the John Hopkins meta-analysis, only saved 0.2% of the lives. So that was about 100 people. So we're going to lose millions for an authoritarian policy which had lots of unintended consequences and made lives unbearable for multi-people and made many people die alone. And the people that enforced them, again, were not following those laws. So... No, I am not prepared to restrict anyone in any way. Instead, it must be voluntary, and it must come from a cultural revolution. 
personal, individual, spiritual, away from consumerism, towards ethics, but there are financial mechanisms which can facilitate that. We can make countries far richer, we can export the technology, we can become very selfish with energy independence, we can uh, avoid geopolitical conflict, and we can live better lives with each other. But we're never going to do that in claiming people's lives and dictating to them how they live to make a utopia because one we're not going to get to the utopia and two when we get there we're going to be so besetted our consciences are going to be so burdened by the atrocities we committed getting to there that we're not going to enjoy it when we have it i think that about covers it actually so i'll sacrifice the last minute yeah i mean just because conversation is, is 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 great you know and and um I mean, just start by commending something you said earlier, which is worthy of Marx's his, his best moments. Don't do anything utilitarian that would destroy the soul, or something like that. I mean, we're agreeing on that because, you know, and, and maybe, you know, for the sake of some artificial conflict, you might have thought something else or, of, of an environmentalist. And I think, um, no, there's no disagreement there. I'm unfortunately reconciled to us not being able to overcome this challenge because it's very important um, that we, we have something worth becoming. You know, it, you can't, there are things, I mean, if you think about um, the things that people do uh, under authoritarian regimes, they, they lose their humanity. And that's not something which is something we should countenance as, as a human race. So are there some things, well, let's put it like this, and maybe that's why I'm quite prepared to talk about these catastrophic scenarios. Because bad though they are, there are things that are worse. So um, I, I, I imagine that um, we might not get, get to where we need to get because we can't change our ways. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's just a fact about, that's a fact which we can change about ourselves. Uh, but we may not get there in time. So yes, that, that's, that's a reality check okay? um, around, around our human predicament. But do I think that if we really understand and value our lives and the incredible diversity and richness that assails us and surrounds us, and we understand how precious that is, that we can't then find it within ourselves to value things differently and better in order to overcome this, well, yes, I do have that level of confidence and faith in human nature, that, uh, in our better selves, to be able to, to actually fix this. But that doesn't allow us, in, in, any, or, or in any authoritarian way, to get what we want, because apparently some, I mean, that's like government house utilitarianism, so-called, right? The idea that we know what's best, but we're going to sell it differently, because if we actually told you the truth, you wouldn't buy it, right? So I'm not in favour of that. One of the main, I think one of the main things that still needs to be teased out and debated between us is this idea of control, authority, and force. And I, I think there's a lot more to be said about that, but there is a common strand here, which that Although we might disagree upon how we're defining those terms, which is very important, and the degree, you know, for example, what you're calling force and compulsion, I might be calling coercion. I might think a better description of that is coercion. I think that coercion is sometimes justified, particularly if we ourselves, and I'm saying in our better moments, because I don't think we, psychologically, I don't think we're equipped to know what's in our best interest and live it on a daily basis every hour of the day. I think that we tend to sometimes bind our... Look, think about prudential reasoning, right? So you might sign up to um, an insurance offer or life insurance, okay? And you bind your future self to taking some of your earnings in order to facilitate your well-being in the future. And so you're making a sacrifice for yourself. Now, on any particular day or year, you might think, well, actually, I wish I had that money today but you've bound yourself, you've committed your future self to something on the basis of a rational decision. So that's how I think coercion can be something which you uh, commit yourself to. That's how we can subscribe to laws which we don't every day of the week want to comply with, but understand that overall it's better that we do, even though it could be massively inconvenient to us on a case-by-case -case basis. So I think there is, a, there is a disagreement about what counts as 
um, authoritarian abuse. There is a disagreement around when a situation becomes controlling, um, especially when I think we voluntarily consented to it, or, and I think there's bound to be disagreement on this because I think you're, pri you sound to me like a libertarian. Now, you know, you, you, I'm sure you're going to correct me if I'm wrong, but see, the, the trouble with libertarianism is that that is, that is, well, not all forms of it, okay? The, the libertarianism that would tell us that you need to adopt an extremely high threshold before um, imposing face masks and, moreover, penalizing people for not wearing them, right? The libertarianism which says that we're not going to penalize people, we're going to allow a little bit of slippage, okay? That's, just, that's a good thing, I would say, overall, right? But the libertarianism which says that the individual is king, I detect a lot of that in you, which is to say that you're not going to let alone judge somebody else, but um, constrain them in what they want to do. And I'm saying that we absolutely do need to constrain people in what they want or choose to do by giving them options which take into account not just the social good, but the likelihood and prospects of future survival for people which aren't around yet. And an egotistic libertarian framework just can't accommodate that because we don't think in those terms. We're too short-termist. I assume five minutes. We'll keep it short. Was that? I thought that was already my five minutes. That I thought we'd both had our five minutes. minutes. I, I'm yeah. under the impression that your initial thing was five minutes, but you're that's, under it, so I can give you a couple. That's totally fine. Yeah, um, I judge everyone. So, uh, yes. What we're quibbling about is... Okay, you say coercion, that's just a euphemism for force. It is, because you have to, uh, w unless you mean cultural pressure, which is free associative. So it may be a linguistic problem, because I agree with cultural pressure entirely. But again, that's bottom up, and that's, that's advice and interpersonal. But you cannot stick the barrel of a gun or a fine or prison sentence behind that, because that is state coercion. Um, I'm a libertarian only insofar as governance, but I'm very socially prescriptive. So that's why I think we can actually come to loggerheads on this, because I do think we should be advising people, considering, and I like the way you framed it in terms of personal relationships, as I said, you should form a personal relationship with the environment and the animals you're caring for, etc. But you should also, in the Burkean sense, have a covenant with the future. Um, your personal relationships are what drive you. And so if we can personally advise, as well as politically pressure, um, to make more sustainable environmental choices, that is how we're going to get out of this hole. But I am not comfortable nor is it ethical, nor will it work because of enforcement costs to force anyone to do any of these behaviours. We need to dismantle the force that is there before we can tackle this problem, even remotely, collectively. Um, I think we should give both our speakers a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, thank you to you both for coming. That was a very good discussion. I'm not sure we've you know, quite solved the issue yet, but I don't think any of us would have expected to. Um, but it was, it was great having you both down. Um, so I think we're all going to go to Salma Bar now, if any of you, uh, anyone would like to join us. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your questions.